Hello again YouTube and welcome back to Just Get A Tesla and this is my Tesla, a 2022 Model Y Long Range. I have had this car for one year, I've done 20,000 miles and I'm going to give you my honest review. And the way that we're going to do this is to split into five different categories because there are different things that I can talk about with regards to the car and I think it's probably going to be quite useful to be able to stick them into a few buckets so to speak. So we're going to talk about practicality, driving, costs, tech and the X factor. What's the X factor? Keep watching and you'll find out. So the first part of the review is practicality. What is this car like for moving yourself, your family and your stuff? around. Well, the first thing to note, it's got this swooping design and the roof line which dips down. So you might think there's not a lot of room in the back. Well, that isn't true and we're going to see exactly why in a minute. It is a big crossover style vehicle. It thinks that it's an SUV, but actually if you go and look underneath the car, there's not a huge amount of clearance. If you've had a proper SUV like a Mitsubishi Outlander, as I had, this will not go in the same places that the Outlander would because the clearance simply isn't there. But it does give you the higher up driving position. And if we get in, the first thing to note is there's actually a lot of space, which you'd expect for a car of this size. The thing that always gets me about this car when I get in it is this glass roof which is just absolutely vast the whole roof is one piece of glass you get a huge amount of light the sheer amount of glass area is the thing that really springs to mind this is quite an upright higher driving position which is great you've got a fab view out of the front the mirrors are well sized and positioned. I have got plenty of room up front and the pedal box is actually neatly lined up to be straight on. So there's no offsets with driving position or anything like that. You have got door pockets, which are both spacious and lined, which is more than you can say for some other cars. Cup holders in the middle. There are two different stowage areas, which I have got full of camera gear but absolutely bags of space with wireless phone charging sat up front there's even and this is quite radical in some cars a glove box which you could fit gloves in it is not constrained by fuse boxes or anything daft like that it's a well thought out interior that genuinely feels spacious when you sat in the front there's even a choice of places to put your arm go up there Go down there. What do you want to do? There's plenty of choice. And then if you go into the back, you'll see there's even more room for your passengers in the rear, despite having this curving roof line. So I'm 5'10". I've got absolutely fist loads of room uh, above this, and I don't bang my head when I get in and out. What's more, I have got acres both of knee room and of feet room and that's the same if you were sat in the middle as well it's a flat floor it's slightly like a dirty floor because this is a working vehicle but there is absolutely piles of space and once again you have got <laughs> space to be able to put your junk in the back and then there's even an armrest with cup holders and it's not just an armrest with cup holders but look there's actually room for my elbow as well as for the cups it's a really well thought out cabin and it doesn't stop there because if we go and have a look in the back one thing that one of the actually main reasons why i got this car rather than the model 3 is the size of the boot which is honestly huge this of course is removable and if you take that out and you drop the seats then you have got a huge van-like loading area which I have used as you can see on screen now several times and then underneath there's even more space to be able to put bags and other junk and these really 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 deep side pockets bags and bags and bags of space and then if we have a look in the front this is 
for me why Tesla absolutely nail this because all of their cars are designed from the ground up as an EV. There is no need to put a motor inverter sack under the bonnet. This is not made on the same production line as petrol or diesel engine cars. Bags of room for all your stuff. So for me, this is one of the most practical cars that I've ever owned. Yes, the Outlander had a slightly squarer back, obviously, that went further back. So I could use that more as a van, but it didn't have as flexible an interior as this does. The next section is talking about driving. What's it like to drive this car? And I have made quite a lot of videos over the last year showing me driving the car in relaxed ways, absolutely thrashing it, doing uh, not to 60 testing, all of those kind of other things. And I'm just gonna drop those in rather than video myself driving along and talking. Because driving wise, this car is what I'd describe as flawed genius. It is not the best driver's car in the world. Quite easily, not remotely that. I have had better handling cars than this. I've had better riding cars than this. What I haven't had is a car that packages all of those things together and gives you that combination of all of the different things. So a key complaint that I have got about this car is that for me, the ride is a little too firm. The dampers are set to basically keep this higher up body under control and obviously the weight of the battery pack. And it's there so that you can throw the car around bends and you can, and it's there so that you can absolutely spank the thing um, away and accelerate at crazy speeds and you absolutely can and it needs to be able to do all of those things whilst maintaining control and that's why this is quite a stiff car the problem with that is that all of that stiffness translates into a ride which is certainly jiggly and at times can be a little crashy it's not the most controlled car going over broken surfaces it's not the most um supple car when it comes to smoothing out some of the the bumps and the imperfections that we get on UK roads. And I think there must be a more compromised way of setting up the springs and the dampers. Tesla seem to agree because lots of people on Facebook groups talk, keep talking about when does the new suspension arrive? Has it got the softer suspension? To the best of my knowledge, all of the cars in the UK are still being built in Shanghai and have got the same chassis and the same setup as this car but that's with me recording this in September of 2023. If you're watching this in the future, hi Doctor Who, um, then that might already be different. Do your own research. The one thing that has surprised me about this car in the year that I've had it is the, the amount of power that it's got, which initially I thought was excessive, but hey, that's what they're giving you, um, isn't excessive. It always puts a smile on your face when you can just overtake with ease past anything. When you can get up to speed almost in an instant, it feels like. This car has got what feels like silly amounts of power, and yet it's able to put it down on the ground in almost any condition, whether it's damp or wet or whatever, without actually scrabbling. I can't think of a single instance that I've had in 20,000 miles where I've had the car scrabbling for grip. And I could get the Model S to scrabble, absolutely. This, no. This is the most planted car that I've ever driven in terms of traction. And the other point as well is, if you are watching this and you've still got a diesel or a petrol car, so you've got basically a mechanical gearbox, an automatic gearbox, semi-automatic. You've got the uh, hybrid synergy drive system for uh, Toyotas, whatever, right? If you've never driven a car with electric motors, you really need to do so. Once you've gone electric, you do not want to go back. This thing is so linear in terms of the way that it applies the power. It's all the power is available at any speed at any time. You're never in the wrong gear because there are no gears. You are never caught thinking, I should have thought about this one a little earlier. Literally, plant your foot and off it goes. 
And what that means though, is that if you are pushing on and driving the car enthusiastically, shall we say, you can do things mid corner with electric motors on front and rear that you just can't do in a car with a gearbox. With this, if you lift off mid corner, it tucks in to the corner because the balance of the car and the fact that you've got a motor on the front that's regenerating tucks the nose in. I've never seen anything like it and I've driven other EVs and genuinely this is the most fun that I've ever had driving any car. And the other thing we should talk about when it comes to driving is charging. And charging is very, very simple. You plug the car in and it charges while you sleep. And for most people, for most uses of a car, that's all you're going to need. It charges up overnight, you drive, you get home, you've still got loads of charge left. If you need to do a longer trip, the Tesla Advantage, and I've talked about this in quite a few videos, the Tesla Advantage is supercharging. It's not just the fact that we've got these brilliant superchargers in increasing numbers across the country. It's the way that it's integrated into the car system. You can plan a route and it will map which chargers you need to go to and it will route you there. It keeps an eye on how many stalls are available and if you're going into a place where some of those are quite busy and there's alternatives, it will route you to an alternate charger so that you don't have to wait. I have never seen a system as integrated as this and as somebody who had an EV back in 2014 where you literally would have a single Ecotricity rapid charger at the odd motorway service center and you would pull up and you might find a queue. Even now in 2023, the supercharger network is much better on an enormous scale versus public charging for every other car brand. And to give an example, there are quite a few motorway locations now where you've got 12 superchargers or more and you've increasingly got 12 of somebody else's chargers. You have got Tesla chargers, which are half the price and twice the speed of the competing chargers. Half the price, twice the speed. That is the Tesla advantage. And I have no clue how the country is supposed to push over onto EVs for everybody with the public charging infrastructure as bad as it is. With Tesla, genuinely, there have been very, very, very few times in the last 12 months where I've really even needed to think too hard about charging. I think about it while I'm doing videos, but as a driver up here, I know that the car has me covered and the car knows where it needs to go and how long it needs to charge for. And that level of reassurance, again, it's the Tesla advantage over everybody else. The third area that we need to talk about is cost. And this is one where, frankly, Tesla lose out a bit to some of the other brands. This car cost £54,000 to buy. And as a car, I would say that it probably isn't 50 grand's worth of car. It's a 35, 40 grand car, and the rest of the cost is the battery pack. This is not a 50 grand interior. It's nice, it's minimal. I absolutely love the screen and it's horizontal, which is the right way rather than vertical, which is the wrong way. But the Volvo S90, which I had, which was another 50,000 pound car, that felt more like an 80,000 pound car. It was a palace, it was exquisite. The materials used and the way that it was screwed together was unreal. This, this, I mean, look, there are little bits of gaps here and there in the trim. I wouldn't have had that in the Volvo. And I could say the same thing on the outside as well. There's the odd little bit of fit and finish that isn't really ideal. There's some design bits, like the back of the seatbelt buckle is plastic and it will rattle on that bit, which is plastic. So you get rattles, which is annoying in a car that costs this much money but it is what it is. The second thing, of course, is insurance. And in 2023, this car has cost me £1,169 to insure. 
and I'm an old fuddy-duddy with no points on my license and eight years of no claims bonus. This car is three times as expensive as it was to insure the Mitsubishi. Now, everybody's insurance costs has gone up because the insurance industry in Britain in 2023 is basically throwing a fit and everybody's pricing is going up by a lot. It's not cheap to buy and it's not cheap to insure. But let's talk about all of the other things when it comes to costs. So I've had this car, as I keep saying, for a year. I've done just over 20,000 miles and the amount of money I've spent servicing it is zero because there is no service interval. There is a recommended program of things that you can choose to do, but it won't affect the warranty. The tires are in excellent condition, despite the fact that I hoof this car around okay i hoof it around because it's got plenty of performance and i have some fun with it and i've still got i think another ten thousand miles of life i've had cars that went through tires in twelve thousand miles and this thing's going to get 30 out of it despite being quite big and heavy and performance that's remarkable so no cost on tires so far no cost on servicing so far no vehicle excise duty the road tax of old is zero and that's a big difference versus the, I think I was up to £365 a year to tax the Mitsubishi and to tax the Volvo before it. So that in itself, it you know, pays for a chunk of the insurance money. The other thing we should talk about is I run this as a company car. And to do so, I am paying 2% benefit in kind, which in essence is basically free compared to anything else that you can get an ev if you're a company car driver is a ridiculously cheap drive okay i pay so little money in tax for this car versus anything else that i could have the other thing of course for me is that this is a company car but i own the company which owns the car and if you buy an ev through a company you can write off tax against the whole value in year one and in my case that was nearly eleven thousand pounds of tax saving when i bought this car eleven grand that is a significant part of the reason why i actually got this car was it is extremely tax efficient not only that but i also charge the car at work because the building that we're in is part house part business the business electricity, you can provide electricity for a company EV without having to give it as a taxable benefit to your employee. So again, that's another area where I can um, do so. Charging costs are the other thing that everybody worries about. How much is it gonna to cost to charge? And is it any cheaper than petrol or diesel? It's quite difficult for me to give you hard comparisons okay because of the fact that it's a company car because of the fact that my company is paying for a lot of the electricity what i would say is that i am getting around 3.8 miles per kilowatt hour from this car on average somewhere around that and if you look at the uh, price per kilowatt that i'm paying for electricity here most of the time that makes it very 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 cheap so you're doing basically 4p a mile which is cheap and even when you drive it out and you're plugged into superchargers where you're then paying you know 39 40p a kilowatt hour you're then talking about 10p a mile that's still cheap if you look at the real world fuel economy that you get from petrol or diesel out there in the real world and especially if you're having to fill the th them up on the motorway where the prices are crazy so it's more money up front it's more money to insure but it's far cheaper to maintain far cheaper to tax and if you're a company car driver it makes vast amounts of sense so all in all from a cost perspective i actually see this as a benefit the next thing we should talk about is tech this car is basically a rolling computer platform and this is something that i know because my car here had to have a 
brain transplant. Literally, the computer decided it wasn't working properly, mapping wasn't working properly, the suite of cameras that you get were not working at all, it decided it wasn't going to navigate, I needed a brain transplant. But here's the thing, Tesla did that quickly and at zero cost. This car has got more stuff on it than I even know what to do. I have done some videos where I've literally talked through every single one of the settings and I've talked through all of the different things that you can do, like playing computer games, like um, watching um, Netflix or Disney Plus or all of those kind of other things, watching me on YouTube. You can do all of those things on this screen. You can even have a Zoom meeting on this screen using the little camera up here. Um, which is a totally mad idea. There's a huge amount of things that you can actually do with it. It also will give you a lot of data about how much energy you are using and what you're burning it on. And it will talk to you about, well, okay, these are the things that are burning power. It will show you how much you're consum consuming and how far that you're going to get. There's an enormous amount of things that you can do with this. And it does make it so that is it a distraction i don't think so i've got used to this screen very 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 quickly okay really quickly and i think here's the thing everything on here is touch screen okay yes i could press and hold this button here and i can talk to the car um but i do not like voice commands it doesn't talk proper like what i do so I don't use voice commands on my phone, on my computer, and I don't do it in the car. You get used very quickly to everything being on here because it's all relatively close to hand. So my hand would be here on the steering wheel. If I want to go to heat, it's just there. If I want to go to phone, it's all within easy reach. And the way I would describe this is it's a bit like when you go from having your phone having lots of buttons or a keyboard to suddenly it's just a screen. And initially you go, how does everything work? I'm never going to make that work. And you do very quickly because you just get used to it. Some of the things on this car are a little bit silly. So some of the things that you can make it do are daft, shall we say. The light show is silly. And I've done a couple of videos with the different light show things. The farts thing is genuinely bonkers. The fact that you can literally stick a roaring log fire on and the fan has just turned on blowing hot air right it's daft it's one of those things that's just a little bit of fun and that's absolutely fine and how on earth ah oh, that's what i say how on earth do i get it off okay fine you know you can have mars as the environment rather than earth it's very very silly but what it does mean what it does mean is that there's a lot of things that this car will do just to make your life a bit easier. And for me, the thing that really makes my life easy is the app. The app is the thing where you literally run the car off your phone. And what that means is that my phone is my car key. So I walk up to the car without having to do anything and open the handle and the car unlocks and I walk away and the car locks itself. I can do a variety of different things on the app remotely. I can warm the car up. I can tell it when I'm going. I can program when the car is going to charge up. So if you've got an overnight cheap electricity rate, no problem. It will only charge when the electricity is cheap. You can tell it what time you're going to leave. So if it's in the winter, it will defrost the car and get it nice and warmed up for you. The app is really clever. And it's that remote technology, which is obviously on quite a lot of cars now, but with Tesla, it's relatively seamless. I have occasionally had to reboot the app because it's decided it's throwing a bit of a fit and doesn't want to work. So you stand there for 20 seconds where you swipe it off your screen and then re reload it and then it works again. It's just one of those intuitive things. Tesla tech basically just works largely. Not everything though, because there are some things like uh, matrix headlights where this car is fitted with headlights which can literally write the word Tesla on my wall. So it's able to poke bits of light in different directions apart from 
when I'm driving and I want it to not dazzle people coming the other way because for whatever reason, the hardware is there and the software isn't enabled yet. And that's annoying. The other elephant in the room, of course, with tech is autopilot. Ah, what can I say about this? In America, full self-driving continues to be tested and improved and fettled. And there are amazing videos of cars driving around by themselves for extended periods of time with no intervention from the driver at all. But this is Europe and we don't have any of those things because we have got a completely different regulatory framework, which means that cars that drive themselves are a no, 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 no. Um, we have autopilot, so the car will drive itself, will steer itself, but you have to have your hand on the steering wheel making little nudgy inputs, otherwise it starts freaking out. We also have um, what they laughingly describe as full self-driving beta, which is not remotely full self-driving. From the test that I did in the Model S, what it does is add more hassle <laughs> and make it more dangerous going through a city than if you haven't got it. I think the future is only going to happen elsewhere. If you're in the UK, forget it. It's a pain in the bum, but it is what it is. And then the last one, which is the X Factor. And I did promise you an explanation as to what the X Factor is. And quite simply, it's does the car put a smile on your face? Does the car make you want to get back in it every time you get out? You know what I mean. Some cars are just an car. It is a vehicle. You walk up to it, you get in it, you drive somewhere. You're not really fussed. It's just a car. It does what it does. You buy it, you sell it, you move on. Other cars are the ones that make you go, yeah. Other cars are the ones where after you've sold them, you miss them. And I've had a few of those in my time. The Mini Cooper that I had back in 2015 for a few years, I still miss that little car. Completely impractical, completely flawed in so many ways. And yet it was just a thing that just made me grin every time I even thought about it. The Volvo S90, not remotely a good car for the kind of Scottish roads that I'm on now. It was on 20 inch wheels with rubber band tires. It had a ride that, you know, was similar to this, harsh and jiggly on anything other than the smoothest tarmac and you could not hustle it. You really could not. The gearbox didn't like going fast. The chassis didn't like going fast, but it was a palace. I adored it until I had to sell it. This is the best car I've ever had by a country mile. And it's not because it's perfect in every way. I've gone through this video and I've listed some of the areas where it's not perfect. It's got technology on board, which doesn't work. It has got not enough ground clearance. It's got a jiggly ride that makes things inside the car rattle. It is not remotely perfect, but it has got personality. And this is something that I think people who've not had an EV assume won't be there because they're used to a car that might have a petrol engine and a rorty exhaust no this hasn't got that because it's electric no but what it has got is punch your head back into the seat acceleration it has got handling that is effortlessly entertaining when you're going places it's got the ability to be able to take me and a whole car full of stuff from one end of the country to the other in comfort without thinking about it. And because of all of the computer gubbins inside it and the fact that I can control it off my phone, it does kind of feel like a part of the family. This has got the X factor. And the other reason why I would say that, and I've pointed this out in a couple of videos, is basically this is the Model T Ford for the 21st century. This and the Model 3, which obviously is on the same platform. The Model T, they built the car in vast numbers with a revolutionary way of screwing cars together. One chassis, different types of body, the same as this and the Model 3, and it literally transformed the industry. That is what Tesla are doing now. So is it perfect? No. Is it cheap? No. Has it got things that I wish they would change? Absolutely. But I'd have another one 
in a heartbeat. And on that note, I'm going to end this part of the review there, but on next week, I'm going to talk about the things that, if I had the chance, I'd get them to change. So, join me for that one, like and subscribe, hit the bell icon so you know when I release that video, and I'll see you very soon back here on Just Get A Tesla.